We are continuing this You Asked, We Answer and going through questions that were asked by the congregation and other people through Facebook um, and some of those things, and we're answering them. And today we're hitting on topics of death um, and taking several different things on death and looking at them. Here are four of the questions I received. Here's what they are. The first one was this, Scott, will my dog Jinx be in heaven? Okay, so if you have a dog, Jinx, you know who you are. Um, but that was one of the questions I got. Uh, next one was this. What's the next thing that happens after you die? So when you die, what's the next exact same, or the next thing that happens in the progression? Um, next one was, I was wondering if my parents are in heaven right now. So are my parents in heaven uh, at this moment? And the last one I got was, do those who have already died still have interaction with those of us who are still living? Um, so those are the four questions I'm going to try to answer this morning. Uh, the first one I'm going to deal with is the more lighthearted one before I get into the really complicated one, um, which is dealing with our death and uh, the life to come after and those things. But the first one is this, um, will our pets be with us in heaven? Now, how many of you have ever asked this one or thought it? Okay, quite a few of you. Okay, I'll see, now you're all kind of admitting it. Here's the thing, just so you know, I am a pet lover. Let me give you a little rundown of my life with pets. And I got my laser pointer here. So can you see a laser pointer? Okay. This gives you a little synopsis of my life with pets because I do love pets. So my first one, this is not really her, but it's a type of dog and she kind of looked like that. Her, she was a peekapoo. And it's my childhood dog. Her name was Cinderella. We called her Cindy all the time. Before her, we had Barky, which was like a black poodle. But I don't remember her too much. She was the one that was shot, right? Somebody shot her in the neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. That's how we grew up. Okay, so Barky got shot. The one I remember is Cindy. So we had Cindy and I had her until like my junior year in high school. Um, so that was Cindy. My next pet was a cat, which personally I don't really care for because I'm allergic to cats, but we got them because my wife loves them. So right here was Mookie. That is Tiger. Mookie has now gone along with Cindy. Tiger's still hanging on. He's like 16 years old now, and he still keeps going. I thought he'd be dead like five years ago, and he keeps going. I can't understand it. Uh, so he keeps going. My next pets were, I had ferrets. I actually had ferrets. When I was up north in Detroit, I had two ferrets up there that I gave away for adoption when I moved down here because they just went fit in our new house that we bring in down here. So they are actually really cool animals if you never had them. They're really cool. So this was Mario, my first one, and that was Luigi, his little sidekick that came on in second. So I had Mario and Luigi. Um, and then my most recent pet is Apple, who's still with us, lives at the house. So that is Apple, our dog we adopted from the pal. So the question comes, are they going to be in heaven? Here, let me answer some of mine for you. That one, I would say, I hope so. My sister would say, I hope not, because she hated my sister, and that was the best thing about it. This dog loathed my older sister and loved me, so it was great. She would literally sleep on the end of my sister's bed, and every time she rolled that night, you would hear the dog like growl at her and nip at her feet. And she lived in fear that dog for years. It was fantastic, okay? Now, if we get into my cats... Mookie, is he in heaven? I hope not. Please, God, if they go to heaven, don't let him be there. Tiger, I can handle. I'm okay with Tiger. If we go to my ferrets, um, Mario, absolutely, I hope he's in heaven. Luigi, please, God, do not curse us with him in heaven. Um, I'll, you laugh. Let me tell you why. This one I had before we had Gideon, so I actually spent the time getting used to him and him playing with me and all. This one I bought because I had a baby and I felt bad for him, so I bought him a sidekick, but I never spent time with him, and he was a lunatic. Lunatic. Bite you, chew things up, you couldn't crowd, he was all over the place, he was a nut. Um, so I'm hoping that one's not in heaven, maybe that one is. And Apple, my Apple, she's beautiful, she's, look at that lovely dog. Okay, Apple's like the perfect little dog, so um, hopefully she's in heaven. Here's the deal, though. Um, we got to understand this about animals. They are not moral creatures like we are. Okay? They're not, they're not moral creatures. For instance, Apple there, a few years ago, had caught a rabbit that got in our backyard somehow, got through our fence and got in the backyard, and Apple grabbed it and, like, chewed half of it apart and then was playing with the other half. Okay? When a dog does that, you're like, Apple, give me the rabbit back, and you take it, and you bag it up, and you put it in the garbage. Okay? No big deal. If my son was outside and caught a rabbit and then torn half of it up and then was playing around with it and flinging it around and stuff and thought it was a toy, there'd be a different issue. Okay, I might be like, oh, Gideon, no big deal. <laughs> Why? Because we, we are moral people. We understand there's rights and wrongs and we understand animals do not. Animals are instinctive. Um, so we know they're not moral animals. 
In Genesis 1.26, it makes it very clear that we are superior to animals. They are not our equals. Um, we live in a society where some start thinking animals are morally equal to us. They're not. Okay, they're not morally equal to us. When you read the Genesis account, it says this, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Okay? Um, at the end of the day, what we find is this. We are superior over animals. They're not our moral counterparts. They're not morally equal to us. And Jesus Christ didn't die for animals. He died for us. But the Bible is also not real clear. Is your individual pet going to be in heaven with you? Bible's not real clear. What the Bible is clear is this. There will be animals in heaven. We do see that, that there are animals there. Will it be your individual pet? I have no clue. So what I would tell you is this. You're free to believe whatever you want. Okay? If you want to believe, if I want to believe that Apple's going to be in heaven someday when she passes on, and that makes me feel fine, that's good. As long as I don't go around saying, I know it's an absolute thing of God, I know she's going to be in heaven. Okay? Or if I want to think that uh, Luigi's not going to be in heaven... That's fine, as long as I don't go around going, I can absolutely guarantee you your pet doesn't go to heaven, that they just cease to exist and are gone. Because the Bible's just not real clear on it, um, but the Bible does show that there will be animals in heaven. Does that answer for you? So you can kind of believe what you want on that one. Here's where it gets more complicated. Let's go to question two, three, and four. Question two is this. What happens right after you die? Then the next question is, is my parent, are my parents in heaven? The last one is, um, which was, uh, the last one was, do the dead interact with the living? Those have already passed on. Let's take some time to answer this. This is where I said this gets complicated. Two parts, two of these questions are fairly easy. One's really rough. And one of them, the best way I can say it is, this must be where most Christian cults get their beginning. Because I went on so many websites reading stuff and midway through them started to realize, oh, this is like a cult, uh, and this is, this is a cultic church, this is an, and they start with this basis, and it's a lot to do with what happens after death and all. And you start reading and going, this is weird. And I read so many of those this week, I can't even tell you uh, the different information I got there. But um, let me answer these in different, uh, in different ways. The first one is this, what happens right after you die? This is a question all of us ponder. Because all of us think about death from time to time. is that minute when you pass, what happens next? Here's the thing that I can answer for sure. That I'd say I'm pretty confident on. As you read, most scholars, almost most scholars across the board would agree with these things. There are two things we can be sure of. The first thing is this. First thing will happen when you die is you will face judgment. Okay, that's the first thing we see scripturally. In Hebrews 9.27, it reads this. It says, And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. Okay? So the first thing we can assume when we die, the next thing that will come will be judgment. Now, as a Christian, that word judgment is not real scary because we know what will happen there. That's not a a scary thing to us as the word judgment seems to be. If you don't know Jesus Christ or you don't know what's going on, judgment, that word does sound scary. But to Christians, we know the next thing that happens is judgment. The second thing we kind of know is this. After judgment, you'll be assigned your eternal home. And that will be in the presence of God in heaven or the absence of God, which is called hell. Um, You'll be in his presence or not in his presence for eternity. You will go to your place. 2 Corinthians 5.10 and says this, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. And then you can read several other scriptures that talk about um, heaven and hell and being in God's, uh, in God's um, uh, presence and out of God's presence. You can see a lot of other scriptures. Those two things I would say I'm fairly sure of. The next question, though, makes it much more complicated, which is this. Um, are those who have already died currently in heaven or hell? Meaning... My dad's who's gone, or my grandparents who are gone, um, are they currently right now in heaven and hell, or are they not? And there are all sorts of theories based on scripture about this. Some believe 
the minute you die, your body dies, but your spirit is with God. He it rises in God's presence, your spirit, until the day that the body resurrection thing will happen when Jesus comes back and then your spirit will rejoin a new body, a heavenly body, okay? There's others that believe you cease to exist. You just are gone and then someday when Jesus comes back, then you will be like almost recreated and, and brought into the kingdom. Um, there's others that believe you go into a state of sleep and you're in a state of sleep for that time between your death until the time that Christ returns and you don't really know what's happened because you're just kind of in a sleep state. There's all sorts of theories, and the best thing I thought I could come this morning to do is this. We're just going to read some scriptures. I will give you at the end of it this, my opinion. That's the best I could go. This is stuff I've been dreaming about for four days trying to go, how do I fit all these scriptures together that make some type of cohesive um, point or statement? Here's the, some of the scriptures I want to look at. The first is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writes this, and this is a very interesting passage, especially the way it starts. Here's what he says. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. So Paul starts a statement off and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to know what happens to you when you die so that you will not grieve like those that have no hope, like non-believers. So you have an idea of what's going to happen so you're not grieving like them. You are not hopeless like them. Then he goes in and he describes the information he wants us to know. And he says this, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we who believe that when uh, Jesus, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Now, if you stop there, it seems to be saying they're with him and he will bring them back with him when he returns. Okay, that's how that sounds there. But if you continue on, it says this. And we tell you this directly from the Lord. Very unusual statement by Paul. He's going... I'm telling you right now, I know this directly from the Lord. This isn't in him just writing or inspired. He's going, I know this is directly at this time from God. And he goes on and he says this. He says, we who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. So here it seems to imply those who have died are still in their graves, and when Jesus comes back, they will rise from their graves. Then it goes on, it says, Then together with them, we who are still alive, so those who are still alive on that day that haven't died, those who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. So he implies this. Jesus will come back. Those who have already died will raise. And then those that are still here living will raise with him. And they will live with God forever. And the encouragement part is not how all that happens. The encouragement part is this. You will live in God's presence forever. Encourage each other with these words is what he's telling them is you will all be together in God's kingdom someday. Encourage each other with that knowledge. But it does lead to what happens if they're rising from their graves from the time they died to the time he returns in that space of time. Let me give you some other scriptures that kind of help uh, decipher this a little more or mix it up a little more. I don't know. John 5, uh, Jesus says this. He says, Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. Those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. So here again, it seems to imply that they will rise from their graves. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, it says this, But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. This is Paul again. We will not all die but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in a blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For the trumpet will sound, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. So again, you get the sense that the dead will rise at the time that Jesus comes back. Now, here's the odd thing. The word died, when you see in most of these, and the Greek, actually, the, the better translation of it is sleep. Those who have fallen asleep. 
um, those who are sleeping, uh, is a better translation. And 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this. He says, yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. I threw that one in because that seems to be different than the other ones, which says the minute you die, you'll be in the Lord's presence. But the others seem to say you'll come out of your graves when Jesus returns someday. Do you see how this gets complicated? Um, so the question comes back to, are those that have died, are they already in heaven or hell as we sit here today? Um, this is my opinion. That's the best I can give you. You search the scriptures, look up the scriptures, and come up with what you come up with. Um, here's my thinking on it. My thinking is when you die, you enter into the eternal. And we know that part. When you enter into the eternal, there is no such thing as past, present, uh, future. Any, it's just there is no concept of time. And my view is at that point, whether Jesus comes back in the way we think here on earth, 500 years from now or five days from now, those that died a thousand years ago to those of us that died tomorrow, at that time to all of us at the same time when he comes back, it will seem like that was the next thing that happened. Okay? Um, I don't know if I would use the words sleep, that people go into a sleep state and your soul's like asleep for this reason. Um, when you enter into the eternal it's the absence of time. There doesn't need to be a sleep state or anything. You're just absent of time. We're still here in the eternal. They are not. Um, those who have passed beyond um, and have passed from this earth no longer are held by time and space or any of that stuff. They're in the eternal. And what we know from that, even though we can't comprehend it, that means there is no past, there is no future, there is no present. It just is. So whether they died a thousand years ago or they die a thousand years from now and then Christ comes back a thousand years from that, no matter where you died in that scale, the next thing you know, this is how I view it, the next thing you know is Jesus is coming back and I'm coming before him. No matter when you died in that time scale. And that would explain for me the scriptures where it says, basically, these people fall asleep and the dead will come from their graves and stuff like that. Some people will ask, does that mean if you were cremated or whatever, you don't have a body to rise from? No, because you're not going back to your dead bodies. It says we will have heavenly bodies, perfect bodies. Okay, people that died a thousand years ago and were buried, they don't have bodies anymore. They're dust. They're dirt. Okay, they, they don't exist anymore. You're not going back to those bodies technically, but it's, it's making a reference. You will come out of the grave at that point. All right? Does that make some sense? Let me give you a couple of examples of that. Lazarus. Jesus raises a dead man who's been dead for three days. His name is Lazarus in the New Testament. And Mary and Martha are his sisters, and he dies, and he's a good friend of Jesus. And they say, can you come? Um, he's died. And he comes back, and he says this phrase to him. He says, he's not dead, he's fallen asleep. Jesus says, he's fallen asleep. And Jesus shows up after three days. He goes in with Lazarus. He says, awake, stand up. And it says, Lazarus awakes, and he's back alive. Now, here's my thinking if Jesus was in God's presence already, he's ticked off. Right? If I, who did I say? Okay. Don't go there. Lazarus. Okay. If Lazarus has been in God's presence for three days in heaven, and then Jesus calls him back into his body to this earth, do you think he's going to be a happy guy? No. I'm going, what are you doing calling me back? I don't care if Mary and Martha want me back or not. I really don't care. I don't want to be back here. I was just in heaven. What makes sense to me is this. Lazarus doesn't even know the difference. He doesn't know he's been dead or anything. All he knows is he's in bed, and now he's waking back up, and he's walking out. And it says he walks out, and Jesus tells him, take the garments off of him. He's probably, in, a, in my sense of view, he's in a fall going, what is on me? And people are ripping it off going, hey, he's back. And then he's probably like, I died? I, I didn't know I died. Last I knew is I died. You know, I was just laying there. Uh, that's how I view it. Another example you have in Mark 5, um, a Roman soldier comes to Jesus and says, my daughter, and she dies. And Jesus says, she's not dead. She's just merely falling asleep. And it says that people laugh at him like, hi, you're an idiot. You're, what are you talking about? She just fell asleep. She's dead. She's been dead for a couple days. Jesus goes in there and he tells her, wake. She wakes up. Uh, so my view is this. My view is when you enter the eternal, time no longer has a concept that we understand time to have and whether you died a thousand years ago in time or a thousand years in the future and Jesus comes back later, you don't know any difference because you're in the eternal. It all happens at once for all of us at the same time. 
Does that make sense? That's my view. Let me get into the next question then, which is this. Um, do those who have already died, do they interact with those of us that are living? So those that are gone, do they interact with us that are living? And my answer to that one, I think, is a more simpler one, which is no. Um, they do not. Let me tell you why. When we die, we face judgment. We go to our eternal home. All right? Um, de at death, we are done with this world. We're done with this world. There's nothing else here for us. We're done um, with this world. Um, if I am wrong, so let's go back and go, my opinion's wrong, which is very possible. And let's say when you die, you are in God's presence, or at least your spirit or whatever is in God's presence. I look at Revelations 21, 3 and 4, and it says this. It says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. I look at that passage and go, if by chance you have people already in heaven and hell, they're not going to be able to interact back here and not avoid pain, sorrow, heartache. Why? We live this life. If you were in heaven, there's no way to come back and interact with people in this life and not have pain and all that. If we are in heaven and we are absent of all that stuff, there's no way you're interacting back um, on this earth. That leads to this question that some people might ask then. Does that mean you're wrong if you talk to your loved ones who have died? How many of you ever talked to someone that's died and you've had a conversation with them? Does that mean you're wrong because I'm telling you, no, you can't have a conversation with them? Here would be my answer. No, okay? We're humans. We're emotional. We find ways to cope. And some of us, that's a coping mechanism that we need, and that's all right. I don't think God has any issue with that. Now, if you use that person who has passed on to go, they're the ones that will supply me comfort. They're the ones that will guide me and stuff like that. Now you're crossing a line because you've taken the authority of God away from him and you're using it for someone else. But to talk to someone that's passed for comfort and all, Absolutely. Now, if you asked me two and a half years ago before my dad died, I would have no understanding of this stuff, and I'd be like, I don't know. Um, but because I know what my mother's gone through and talking to her and stuff like that, and even in my own life, you know that's what you do at times. Why? It's coping, and that's okay. So can you talk to someone that's already died? Is it really them to hear? No, and most people will admit that are Christians. I know they're not really there, but it helps me. And God gives you that ability for that to help you. And God supplies that for you to go. And that's why they were part of your life for the time that they were. Okay? Now, that's okay. So here's what I want to wrap up today. What do we take from the questions and answers today? Because I want to leave you not just with a, here's some educational thing. You can think this way or what. What can you take today from that? And here's what I think it is. It's a very simple message. And the message is this. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have no reason to fear death. No reason to fear death because to be absent from this body is to be with the Lord. No reason to fear. You know what's coming. You know judgment and placement are coming. And if you are a Christian, you know it says you can have confidence when you come before the, uh, the, the throne of the Lord. Why? Because you know you're right with him because of your relationship with God. So death should not be something you fear in your life. Why is that important? Let me tell you why. If you don't fear death, you will fear nothing else on this, in this world. Death is the number one fear we have, the unknown, the death. When that's cleared up, nothing else can scare you in this world. And if you are not fearful of anything in this world, it leaves you to be completely unhindered to live for Jesus Christ and to do his work while you're here. Think about it. Why do we pursue materialism and stuff so much? If you really boil it down a lot, it's out of fear. I want to have purpose in my life. I want to make it feel like I'm doing something, accomplishing something, and I'm fearful I won't. So if I can accomplish all these things and have the stuff around me, it somehow gives me value. No, you're just doing stuff out of fear. Why do you make this decision and try to please these people and disobey God? A lot of times because we fear how those people will react. So I fear those people will withdraw their relationship. I fear these people will retaliate. I fear I will lose my job if I do the Christian thing. 
And we live in constant state of fear. And when you can get over to fear of death, you can get over to fear of everything else in your life. And when you do that, you are unhindered to live the life God has called you to. And you can have an incredible impact on the world around you at that point. Because no longer do you live in fear of people and fear of the future and fear of what might be. All you care about is this. I know whether I die now or I die 50 years from now, I will be in the presence of God. And while I'm here, I'm here to serve him. That's why it's important and why Paul says, I want you to understand what will happen when you die and to comfort each other with these words. We don't have to fear death. Does it bring us sorrow at times? Absolutely. We don't have to fear it. Do you have to fear the ceiling's going to collapse on you right now? No. If you're newer here, you know we have a metal ceiling. So especially in the springtime, as the sun comes out and it heats up, it expands and it pops. Okay, so don't fear the roof collapsing on you. Because even if we all die right now, guess what? I'm going to see you the next thing I know in the kingdom of God. And here's the hope. Those that have died that know Jesus, you will see them again. They are not gone forever. Um, all they are is separated from us for this moment as we still live out this life here. And someday we will be with them in the presence of God again. And you can take hope in that as a believer and you can look at that and it can change your entire worldview of how you live every day of your life. Don't live in fear because you know what happens to you when you die. Would you pray with me?